So um, my name is Caroline Hodgson. Um, I'm the current president of the Bradford Textile Society. I'm delighted to welcome you all this evening. And um, as usual, we're delighted to have uh, not only our members, um, but some new attendees and also uh, tutors and students from uh, many academic institutions. This is our fourth online uh, lecture of the series focused around design, innovation and sustainability. Um, the Bradford Textile Society has been running its design competition for the past 90 years now. And uh, this is the first year that um, entries will be submitted digitally. The deadline for submissions um, is now Friday the 21st of May and um, we'll be able to receive your entries from the 20th of April. Um, instructions for submission will be on our website and we'll also be um, emailing, emailing those out to the tutors. But if you'd like to receive direct details, uh, please do contact our secretary, Sue Geldard, and um, Vivian will be posting her email address in the chat or um, you, her contact details are on our website. So um, I would now like to introduce um, this evening's guest speaker. We're delighted that uh, Juliet Bailey, um, co-founder uh, um, and director of the Dash and Miller Studio and the Bristol Weaving Mill can join us this evening. Hello Hi. Juliet. Hi. Uh, so Juliet will share how um, faced with the recession of 2009, um, she along with co-founder Frankie Brewer founded the globally reaching design and development studio, Dash and Miller. They then went on to set up the Bristol Weaving Mill in 2015, um, a micro mill that facilitates accountability, traceability and sustainability in their sampling and production. So um, Juliet's going to speak for around 40 minutes. And then um, if you have questions, please post those in the Q&A and I will put those to Juliet at the end. Um, we're aiming for a 7.30 p.m. finish, ideally. Um, and um, as I said, any questions in the Q&A, and if you have any technical issues, if you put those in the chat, uh, that just helps us to answer um, your queries most effectively. So I'll, I'll hand over to Juliet. Thank you, Caroline. Um, thank you to also Vivian and Sue as well for setting this up. It's a real honor to be asked to speak. So I'm just going to share my screen. I've got some slides for you. Uh, just bear with me. To start the slideshow. It just takes a couple of minutes. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a real honour to be asked to speak next to um, the people who've been on the other uh, talks. I'm just, yeah, there we go, getting my slides to start. Um, so I thought I would start off by just giving you a bit of an introduction to Dash and Miller Design Studio because that's kind of where our story started. So um, this is like a snapshot of our team today. We've got um, myself and Frankie Brewer, my business partner, at bottom left and centre. And then our designers, Libby, Emma and Eve. So this is our in-house design team at the moment. And we also have 11 incredible freelancers who um, provide us with non-woven design um, embroideries, uh, other mixed media techniques, etc. Um, so as Caroline said, we started uh, Dash and Miller in the recession of uh, 2009, um, off the back of the financial crash, which was at the time, I think, um, a decision that benefited us because it meant that we were starting really from a position that could only go up upwards um, we started off just by hand looming designs and uh, approaching brands to see if they were interested in our work um, and it, it quickly grew from there so um, an overview of what we offer now as a studio is hand loom design so we're the hand looms are key to everything we do at dash and miller um, so we have a speculative collection of handling designs that we usually travel the world with to um, show to various different brands and clients, but obviously that's not happening at the moment. Um, all of this speculative design is backed up by really thorough trend and market research. So um, we do our own trend work and trend studies, and we also offer a trend consultancy service. 
alongside our woven design service. Um, colour work is also something that we offer, so we collaborate with mills to provide them with um, colourway designs or to recolour their designs or to provide colour inspiration for their collections um, and consultancy as well. So not only the trend consultancy, but we also offer a woven consultancy service where we either work on hand looms or with CAD. So we, we may be setting up our looms with their technical specifications of a supplier and then hand looming designs that are production ready, um, or it might be simply working with CAD software to provide files that are we basically weave ready, um, helping them to, I suppose, um, yeah, helping them to be able to go straight from design development straight into production. Um, so you can see in this image here, we've got um, the TC2 loom has, has been really central to our design studio capabilities. Um, so we offer Jacquard and Dobby developments and um, our Dobby looms range from eight to 24 shafts. Um, another area that we've been getting more and more into and it's growing for us is yarn and raw material sourcing. And I think that goes hand in hand with um, the need for sustainability and traceability that um, is really required these days. So we now work quite closely with um, brands and also on research projects to source yarn, um, recycled yarn or sustainable yarns um, for specific projects. So um, normally, as I said, we'd be traveling a lot and meeting with our clients face to face. Obviously, that's now happening digitally, but our main markets are normally um, and, cu and currently USA, Italy, France, Germany and Japan. Uh, so France and Germany in particular for the trade shows as well that we attend there. So it's normally Premier Vision uh, for the fashion and then Heim Textile for the interiors. And our studio covers a range of end uses from interiors to fashion women's wear, um, press of water, ready to wear, but also um, high street and sportswear as well, particularly sports footwear. Um, and also automotive as well. So we also provide consultancy services for automotive textile development. Um, our main purpose as a design studio, I think, is, is to facilitate um, very efficient design development. And we, we have a network around the world of mills that we partner with or that we have um, really good relationships with that we can also recommend to our clients, but we also can link with our clients and their existing suppliers. Uh, so one of the mills we've worked with for years, a few years now is um, Stephen Walters and Sons in Sudbury. So very soon after we started the business, we struck up a collaboration with them so that we could see our designs produced for women's wear. So um, we offer custom developments um, using their existing warps and dock yarns we have a seasonal collection as well, but um, as with most of the ready to wear clients, they're looking for custom, mostly for custom developments. So we've worked with a range of different clients, um, including uh, Dax, Bottega Veneta, and Mulberry Pringle. Um, and yeah, we've got a really, I think we've got a, quite a, a, a close working relationship now. So we, we really understand the capabilities of the mill and we're able to, send weave ready files to them um, that they can then just check and amend if necessary and put straight onto the looms. Um, so we, we tend to do most of the design development for that collection in CAD, but um, occasionally we will hand loom something as well if necessary. Um, the, this slide shows a, a range of our hand loom developments and how they've been translated into finished products. So this is to really give you an idea of how clients are using our designs. So um, top left, we've got a sportswear brand, Luli Lemon, and that is a woven swatch that they've translated into a print for leggings. So it's not always that our woven designs are being used directly for woven fabrics. Sometimes they're used for inspiration for other things. Um, 
in the center we've got one of our top center we've got one of our freelance designers who um does beautiful yarn wrap and laser cut bonding techniques and this again has been translated in, into a print for wrap london um top right we've got a design that's uh wo is a sort of combination of a weave and embroidery um and this has been translated into contract interior fabric as a jacquard um underneath that on the bottom right we've got uh, a woven design that's inspired and led to a, another woven design so the constructions have been um carried across to a different quality um and they've used their interior specific yarns um and then bottom left we've got um, some fabrics that we've directly translated into ready to wear fashion so those are exactly the fabrics that came off of the handling um and then of, of course bottom center we've got um a little image of one of our jacquard designs so the jacquard was really like i said before really key to our capabilities as a studio to be able to um work with a really broad range of clients um so in terms of our approach to design and innovation um our sampling service is basically most predominantly done on hand looms so um we are working on hand looms every day basically it's like it's the sort of key to us being able to offer a fast responsive service to our clients um and also that we find that working on hand looms gives us a real ability to be really responsive in terms of design development and creativity so we're making decisions directly on loom um, sometimes we will cad something before it goes to loom but quite often um, all of the actual design decisions and um, color choices for example structures etc are developed on the hand loom um, because we're able to work this way it means that we're able to turn around samples within a matter of a few days um, we have a lot of yarn here. You might be able to see some of it behind me, but we have um, we make sure that we have um, everything that we think would be relevant for our clients sort of available into hand. Um, and of course, I guess our, we're working with the, some of the best yarn suppliers in the world, so they are really quick. Obviously, if we need to send if we need them to send a, a sample or a cone to us. Um, so yeah, this sort of trend led experimental hand looms is. Sort of the core of our business but then we also do do production so we partner with Stephen Walters but we also partner with um, a couple of mills in Italy to be able to deliver uh, fancy tweed fabrics as well to our ready-to-wear customers and again those would be hand loomed here using the setup before going to production in Italy and we usually find that um, the translation from the hand loom to the production is, is quite accurate we um i suppose i over the years we've built up a lot of knowledge about the production capabilities and restrictions etc so we're able to quite accurately simulate that um so here you can see on the right hand side some sid sucker developments um that we've recently completed and bottom left we've got some fancy tweed um, and then top left the the silk developments from stephen walters um so here you are, this is like a, a bit of a snapshot, I guess, of um, our technical files and how we work. And this is probably nothing new for a lot of people, but just to sort of share with you some of our process. Um, so when we're doing our hand woven collections in particular, we make sure that all of our designs are CAD supported where possible. So not everything is, if it's, if it's a really creative conceptual design, um, it may be that it's uh, in a cat effect, maybe with a warp that's been painted on the loom, we'll make sure we try and document it as best we can. But um, our goal as a studio is to provide a fully supported CAD service for our creative designs. So we will talk with our customers to make sure that we can present the CAD files in as sort of user-friendly, compatible way as possible. We have our standard formats um, of how we present things, but we always have a conversation just to make sure that we're presenting things as best we can for that particular client. Um, so that might be through um, weave technical files. So you've got your peg plans, obviously, and your um, it might we may lay it out as a jacquard if that's going to be the intention, or it 
could be a, like a fully drafted Dobby cloth with the thread up um, and the simulated fabric as well. Um, we also can do repeats as well. So we would sort of adjust the design to fit a certain repeat if it was not quite right for the client. Um, and recently actually we've been doing a fair amount of color separation. So we will also offer sort of a supported service where we'll um, take a high resolution image of the actual design and um, break down the design by color and layer to enable the client to see colorways before they decide to commit to production of that design. Um, so yeah, our main, our main programs and tools for that are Point Cray, Photoshop and Illustrator. So yeah, moving on to how we ended up um, starting Bristol Weaving Mill. So this is a bit of a journey that we went on. Um, after a couple of years of running Dash and Millie, we, we sort of realized that especially for the fancy tweeds and for the sort of sort of more thicker, woollier qualities, a lot of clients were asking if we could handle production. And um, we had our existing relationship with Stephen Walters, which was um, wonderful for the silk qualities, but for um, the sort of heavier, tweedier, tweedier designs, um, we hadn't partnered with anyone as of yet. So we sort of set about doing research about what was available in the UK, you know, who we could work with, etc. So um, we applied to the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Trust, which is an amazing charity run by the Royal Warrant Holders Association. Um, and they very kindly awarded us a, a grant for a self-led sort of learning period that we could take a sabbatical from the design studio without it affecting the business. Um, and with that, we ended up traveling all around the UK to visit all of these uh, companies mentioned here in the bullet points who really kindly um, opened up their doors to us and let us in and to talk to us about their capabilities and their processes and showed us the machinery and we we sort of were really learning I suppose we we're meeting potential partners for working with but also learning about production um, capabilities and what was possible because uh, we were fairly young when we started Ashman and we hadn't, neither of us had had experience working within a production facility. So it was quite important for us to really understand the limitations of the machinery or how the finishing is executed, et cetera. Um, so what we found during our journey is that we not only found people that we could partner with and work with, but we also found that um, we, we would probably want to be able to control a certain element of the sampling um, and we also began to realize that uh, to bring an industrial loom into the scenario probably wasn't such a huge undertaking that we imagined it might be and that it's, it seemed to be it felt very possible after speaking to a meeting a lot of these people um, so in it was a couple of years in the making, but um, in 2015, we actually sort of officially started trading as the Bristol Weaving Mill. Um, the year prior to that was spent sourcing machinery and um, bringing the right bringing the right people together in order to do that. So um, here on the right hand side, you can see a bit of a snapshot of um, the mill, how it looks today. We've got this one industrial loom. Um, and then three and in the back of the shop, we've got the three hand looms that we also use for sampling and hand loom production. Um, so the industrial hand loom, I mean, essentially the mill has been set up as like a, a prototyping in a small run facility. So we are in some ways treating our industrial loom a bit like we treat our hand looms. You know, we're using it for quite experimental projects and very different projects. We're not putting consistently the same warp on. We're changing the setup every every single time. Everything we do is bespoke. So um, yeah, so because of that, we, we felt like we really needed a loom that could handle that sort of versatility. And um, we ended up sourcing a 1985 Dornier loom. So it's punch card operated um, and it's sort of fairly low tech so that we are able to really control it in the way that we want to. It's all cogs and belts. It's not so much computers. Um, 
and it's been quite versatile for us it's allowed us to do quite different types of walks and projects one after the other uh, so we're, yeah we're weaving at 180 centimeters wide on that loom and then we've got hand looms of 120 and 150 as well um, in order to set up we were actually awarded a european regional development fund grant which was really key to helping us get off the ground um, and very much appreciated at the time um, and also the other people that we met in the industry around the uk during the setup process were so helpful so people who met from Alatex, for example who supplied the dornier looms they've been incredibly generous with their time and support and knowledge expertise etc um so yeah when we started the mill we had this intention that it would be um more of a, a direct partnership with dash and miller that we would be supporting dash and miller with the sampling process but really quickly we realized that um the mill has very much its own um style and it's its own sort of client base we found really quickly that because we were starting this sort of small scale manufacturing from the ground up, we were able to make really informed decisions about how we operate from a sustainable point of view. So sourcing yarns to work with, etc. Um, and it very soon became apparent, I think, to us that um, the mill had its own identity and that we were going to sort of follow that path so we've always been open to the opportunities that come to us and um the, the the sort of sampling for fashion that um we were doing for dash and miller we've actually now continued to do that with partners in italy because um the responsiveness they can have for that type of project um has been has been quite key uh, for us in that respect but the mill we um we've become over the years more of a I guess a, sl a slower textile facility so we're working um again with more sustainable brands and fibers etc so um just gonna flip forward one slide this is our current team at the moment um so we've got um anna ruena fiona and alice and it's a snapshot of um alice weaving at the handling as well so um our main overview of what we're doing at the mill is um, small sample runs on the industrial loom. So that might be up to 100 meters, perhaps. Um, and then we work with partner mills in Yorkshire um, to weave bulk production. Um, we also have other partners in the UK because we're, we're, we're just the sampling facility. So we've got obviously the warpers that we work with, the spinners that we work quite closely with, yarn suppliers and finishers. Um, so our, our key seasons at the mill, I guess, are more the autumn winter season because we do a lot of wool and a lot of um, alpaca fabric and products. Um, but we are working on these projects all year round as well. It's because we're working sometimes with fibres right from the beginning of the process that can sort of take a fair amount of time if you're sort of consulting to get something spun, for example. So um, we tend to sort of we don't have like focused busy periods, but we do certainly sink in with the traditional sort of autumn winter season, I suppose. Um, so I'm gonna flip forwards again, just to show you a few different types of things that we are doing at the mill. And hopefully this will give you a bit of an insight into how we work in our development and design processes. So one of the key areas that have been really important for us is to work with fiber producers. So. The UK has an incredible number of people who are breeding rare breed sheep, for example, or alpacas, um, who maybe want to explore different avenues for their fibre other than the wool board, for example. So we will speak to these people and sort of partner with them right from the beginning, sometimes even before the animal has been clipped so that we can advise them on how to have their yarn spun. We'll kind of do a meeting with them to consult and find out what their kind of end goal is, whether it's blankets or scarves or apparel fabric, for example. Um, so yeah, this is a few shots of different products that we've made. It's, it's mostly undyed fibres. So we, we're mostly working with the natural animal fibre colour, but occasionally we do also work with natural dyes as well. So um, on the left-hand side of the, 
screen you can see a fabric that was called the Bristol cloth. And this was a really interesting collaboration with a natural dyer um, called Botan Botanical Inks, who basically um, the orange colour came through um, onion skin dyeing uh, from waste, sort of onion skin waste from restaurants around the local area. And the yarn itself came from just outside of Bristol. So the product itself was kind of grown and created just around Bristol, hence the Bristol cloth. So um, that was a really lovely showcase of um, working with a regenerative farmer to create a product that's got a really low carbon footprint and that um, is made locally where possible. Um, so yeah, quite often we are sort of testing the fibres for the first time. So the hand loom in this process is really critical because um, it's, it's a brand new yarn. Every time it has its own quirks and um, in, order, in order to really understand how to best use it, the hand loom is absolutely key. So um, that's a really integral part of developing these types of products. Um, and then of course, year on year, the, the animals, the flocks change. So if you're coming back to another collection the next year is going to be a quite a different amount of yarn or different colours that you're working with. Um, so it kind of gives really good scope for developing products every year and building on a collection. Um, another good area for us has been working with uh, other weavers and textile producers. So I think because we are ourselves fairly experimental and we like to weave I guess we like a challenge, but we also, um, we're all designers here at the mill. So we are, we really understand how sort of the hand weavers and the other woven textile producers of design product like this are working. Um, so I guess it's, it's quite a, a nice collaboration to be able to take a hand woven product into sort of a small scale production run. Um, so this is just a few examples of different mostly blankets that we have done, but we also do cushions as well. Um, interiors has become predominantly what we do at the mill. So product is now our key strength. So we're working with um, larger interior brands such as Neptune and Heels um, and the New Craftsman, and we're creating like fully finished product for them. So all of these, uh, products are originally sampled on hand looms again and um, that was still key to our development process but we also do support that with CADS um, and I think we offer basically to them is like a, a seasonal newness so we're able to create a new collection for them every season um, and that's I guess that's sort of our USP and how we work with them so we're sourcing mostly British yarns uh, where possible um, yeah, and creating these very sort of design-led sort of seasonal trend pieces. So we're working with these brands from the, the sort of mood board concept stage right through to the um, merchandising, which is really interesting. It's We kind of see it as our job to see, go in and see what their collection, existing collection is and sort of find the gaps and where we can bring interest and newness into the collection. Um, Interior designers have also become quite a key part of what we do. So um, this sort of page showcases quite an interesting project that we've had the pleasure to be working on. Um, there's a weaver called Alison um, Morton and we have become custodians, I suppose, of her qualities. So that's been a real honor for us. And it basically consists of hand-woven linen products. So we're working with Swedish linen from a Swedish company um, and creating all sorts of linen products and fabrics um, for interior designers and I was I was really fortunate enough to go and spend a day with Alison to so she could sort of pass over her knowledge to us for how to create her products so that's been um, quite an amazing development we hadn't anticipated when we started um, and then of course we've got the industrial well, the, the production hand looms. So we do offer um, hand, weave, hand woven production up to lengths of about, I mean, we can do walks up to about 150 meters. Um, 
but it's, it's quite rare we do one we do walks that long but there's, these are a few examples of the types of projects you might do by hand so the, the hound's tooth is a tassel silk um hound's tooth that was created for a couture designer um and then the linen wool quality the other three qualities are um created for an italian designer who mostly sells her products in tokyo and in, in japan so we're able to do things like inserting fiber raw fiber into the weave as we're weaving and um i suppose the idea of perfect imperfection is is, is quite predominant in her collection so we're able to deliberately put faults into fabric or put two yarns through at the same time in a certain way that wouldn't be possible in production so um it's really fun for us to I suppose yeah try and use the hand looms in a way that you you wouldn't be able to achieve in production um and then finally another area for, that's quite important for us is to create woven solutions to textile waste so that might be um salvage waste our own salvage waste sometimes um or salvage waste from other mills uh, so on the left hand side you can and the bottom middle you can see um floor floor rugs that have been woven using salvage waste from various different mills around the uk um and then we have fabric remnants as well so uh, the image on the right hand side you can see our fabric remnants that have been hand woven um, and then in the top middle we've got um waste yarn so that this yarn for example was from a floor manufacturer of um carpet tiles and the yarn that's left over after the production process can sometimes be one or two kilos left on the cone it can't be recycled it was ending up in landfill so we took the yarn to um weave into floor runners and flat woven flat woven rugs and um that was quite a successful way to sort of reuse what what's essentially a waste yarn um so just to give you a bit of an insight about our approach to innovation at the mill, because it's quite different to Dash and Miller, where at Dash and Miller we are working very much in a, a really trend driven, forward thinking way. At the mill, we are um, also working that way, but in a slightly sort of slower pace, I suppose. So we are um, also assuming different roles at the mill. We might be a project lead um, where we're sort of directing a project including um this sort of trend information but we also might then be working as a consultant um a facilitator for example for a hand woven a producer of hand woven products who needs a partner to help get their um products woven industrially or it might be a collaborator um so a lot of what we do in the sample development and prototyping stage is actually final products, not so much just concepts. So um, I guess uh, you can see in the top right, we've got an actual sort of sample product that's the cushion cover that's been hand loomed. Um, then in the middle top, we've got um, a really good sort of example of how we can use the hand loom just to showcase different colorways of the client's designs. That's a really nice way to see everything. Um, we are also working on jacquard at the mill, so we, we don't have jacquard facilities in-house at the mill, but we are working, collaborating with a mill called John Spencer to do jacquard. Um, and again, the experimentation that we can bring into our products that um, might be through finishes. So we have a small sort of industrial washing machine here, for example, and we do brushing and all sorts of different finishes. Um, we can simulate by hand with a view to then having them manufactured. So we, we work really closely with the finish as well. We'll be sending them swatches of our hand created finishes and sort of giving them notes about how we've created it. And then they'll interpret that into industrial processes. Um, and then of course, working collaboratively with the spinners and the fiber producers, um, which has been an incredible addition actually since we've started doing that uh, to what we can offer. So that's in the last sort of a couple of years we've started working quite closely with the spinners um so yeah this is a kind of as a 
juxtaposition like an example of the kind of CAD work we're doing at the mill. It's, it's fairly different in format to Dash and Miller. Um, so we will be doing full product specs, for example. So we'll be taking a woven dobby cloth and we'll be um, simulating the fabric and then simulating product as well, whether it's cushion covers or um, blankets, for example. But we're also, because we're working with partner mills, we're also using their uh, technical specs. So it might be a, a traditional weave ticket like we've got on the bottom left um, in order to sort of translate our design onto their system. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a much more sort of, yes, I suppose a little bit more low tech than Dash and Miller, but um, the end use is really specific. So it's, it's very sort of targeted. Um, I mean, at the moment, we are sort of moving into this new world where the pandemic has hit everything that we're doing. And the mill is sort of relatively unaffected, I think, because we are quite diverse in our customer base and we are fortunate enough to be working on these slightly slower paced uh, projects and with home interiors as well. Um, but we still are seeing I suppose a need for digitization and the Dash Miller in particular, where um, everything that we do has kind of changed the way that we do it. Um, it's been really important for us to be able to digitalize our collection. So this is an example, um, just to share with you an example of how we've digitalized our Dash Miller design collection. We've built a sort of a online platform where everybody can log in and see our whole collection and see our designs and um, I can't show you here, but you can click into each design and see the detail and um, photographs and videos of how the design looks. Um, so yeah, we're using a lot, obviously like everyone else, we're using Zoom and a lot and WhatsApp and more digital platforms to communicate and find new, new ways to work. And that is so far working for us, which is um, we're really thankful about. Um, but I think it, in some ways this sort of need for digitization has been long overdue. It's something we have been talking about a long time at Dash Miller in particular. Um, because we are already sort of working in a sustainable way because we're controlling the manufacturing at the mill, um, it's been really one of our things that we wanted to tackle at Dash Miller is to find ways of being more sustainable and working more sustainably. So now obviously we're working with yarns that are from a sustainable source. Um, we're working with recycled yarns and um, natural yarns where possible. Um, and I think converting into these digital processes has only really benefited our plan for how to create a more sustainable future for Dash and Miller. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's been a sort of a difficult process, but it's actually ultimately really beneficial. Um, so this is my, it's actually my closing slide, but it's, um, I think a really good summary of how each company works. So at Dash and Miller, you can see on the right, we've got really sort of very diverse, different, more experimental techniques, um, and yeah, very sort of trend driven design. And then at the mill, we've got this beautiful array of designs that are actually woven with our clients own yarn in a range of beautiful colours, so more looking at, I suppose, um, exploring the range of things that we can do with a client's specific yarn um, and how that can be. These are all um, blanket qualities, so looking much more for a specific end quality, whereas at Dash and Miller, we are, a lot of our designs, unless we're working on project work, are very sort of open-ended. They could be translated into a print or it could be translated directly as a woven fabric or they could be used as inspiration for a texture or um, some other process. So I guess that kind of nicely summarises the difference between how the two companies work. Um, and I think moving to the future, um, we are looking to, I mean, we are sort of looking to more sustainable ways of working all the time. It's kind of part of the core of how we are operating. Um, so we're really excited that we are actually now partnering with a company called CoForest to carbon offset, which is super exciting for us. Um, 
but other ways of working in terms of you know making sure that everything we make is made to order there's no waste there's no stock for example um we are also part of the southwest england fiber shed so um working to make sure things are sourced locally where possible um and i think um being part of that sort of network, local network has been amazing, especially for the mill. But um, for Dash Miller, that's something that we want to push more in the future as well. Um, but I think in terms of how we're working, the handling is always going to be key to what we're doing. And I don't think that's ever going to change. I think it allows us to be responsive and to give a, a really um, creative, innovative service to our clients. So. Um, I don't see that changing anytime soon, even though we are going through this whole digital process, this digitization process, the handling is still always going to be key for us. So I hope that's given a bit of an insight into how we work. Um, yeah, I'd be really interested to know what people's questions are. So, <laughs> Hi, Caroline. Hi, well, thank you for that fascinating uh, presentation, Juliet. Um, really show the scope um of, of your work um Thanks. and the versatility and uh, it was interesting to see how the two businesses complement each other and how bristol weaving mill has brought yeah. flexibility to um your your design and um yeah. and how you work and uh, and it was also really positive to see um just how supportive um the industry had been when you were doing your research and uh it was incredible so just what a friendly industry it is to be in. i know <laughs> yeah exactly yeah mm -hmm. it really is so we've got um quite a few questions that have come in so um we'll do our best to to get yeah. through those um so just um starting off um from um jill craven what advice can you give to those currently yeah studying textiles and fashion um, as to the skills required to transition from, from studies to industry? Um, so I would say that um, I think that I think technical understanding is, is has been really key for us in that transition. So myself, when I graduated, my tech, my level of technical understanding was not, not that great. And I think I think basically if you can if you can um really focus on that and become as strong as possible in your sort of technical understanding of weaving and textiles that's really important i think showing diversity in your work but but also um i think an understanding of of what's available to you within the uk if you're working and you want to work for a uk company for example i suppose what's what's what resources are available within the uk is is really important to be aware of and i think if you can also i suppose do a bit of a study like we did i guess but maybe not actually going into these companies but to to really do your research before you approach your company i think that's really important to like understand truly what their product is and what they're doing what they're offering and um, that's another tip i think as well mm -hmm. and um what what cad systems um you mainly use for the weaving um, um so we're actually using a system called called point Carré, mm -hmm. which is a french company and we they've got a dobby and a jacquard program mm. but we find um because we work a lot with photoshop as well we we sort of find that that is quite symbiotic symbiotic and that it, it partners quite well with photoshop functions and it's quite user friendly um because we're used to that sort of interface i suppose mm -hmm. So you're able to sort of communicate with the other mills and tran translate accordingly to exactly yeah. yeah it gives us enough versatility that we can send files that are formatted for other programs um or in a format that another program can read <clears throat> but it also yeah. enables us to do quite good fabric simulations so mm -hmm. um yeah it suits it suits what we do quite well yes. yeah um so from Katie, how can emerging designers and makers partner with you at the Bristol Weaving Mill to manufacture designs on a larger scale? Um, are all the designs you produce at Bristol Weaving Mill your own? I think you, you showed a, um, a number of people 
um, designers that you're yeah. um, working with and, and producing for? So, yeah, you? The, mm -hmm. the designs that we are doing for like the interior brands, like Neptune, for example, they're all our designs that we've proposed to them. But um, if, if, for example, it's somebody like a hand woven product designer who wants them to have their designs manufactured, um, yeah, we have basically an, an agreement with them that you know it's their design, and we're just helping them make. We're just helping them through the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, we would have just have a conversation where we will sort of speak about what exactly we want to achieve, um, and maybe there's limitations in production that um, you might not have for handling, for example. So we'll have a bit of consultancy with them to. To talk them through what changes might need to be made in industrial, industrial production mm -hmm. um, and then if they just want a small run we do it in-house but if they want to we always have the option of working with our partner mills to do the bulk production if they want larger quantities or if they suddenly get a large order um, we can then sort of support them in that way as well mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah it's, it's mostly a conversation and at the moment obviously meetings are in zoom format but um, normally we would invite people to the mill to come and see the machinery as well and really understand get an understanding of how it works etc it's just following on the back of that question from marie do you make small scale jacquard samples um i think marie is a, a design student or do you only work with brands um so we do we do at dash miller we do um jacquard handling sampling so we can do small samples for jacquard that way mm -hmm. um it depends on the quality. So we, it, it, we've got um, the jacquard handling that we have here, we can do kind of really versatile qualities with, but um, with our partner mills for production, <clears throat> we've got sort of specific qualities that we're working with in jacquard. So we've got the Stephen Walters, the silks, and then we've got the kind of wool fabric and wool blanket um, production that we do at John Spencer. So, um, yeah, it's it is possible. It just depends what it is, basically. Um, it's not like yeah, we have to yeah. sort of look at it case by case. Yeah. yeah. Um, but presumably, anyone who's interested in in working with you can contact you. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, we have um yeah contact forms on our websites, and they just come straight. They come to me. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And um, how do you go about pricing your various services for clients, such as mm. working with um fiber producers to designing and producing collections for heel heels new craftsmen yeah etc um so we have um i suppose different ways of pricing things depending on how how the client wants to work it it's we have to be quite versatile because um a, a company like heels for example we would um absorb all the development charges etc into the final product so there's no kind of upfront charges or anything like that it's all sort of factored in to the final product um but a lot of people especially hand woven product designers who come to us they may want to supply their own yarn they may want to um i suppose that they, they'll be more involved in the development process they may want to do the handling developments themselves so Again, it's more a case by case thing. Everything we do is pretty much bespoke. It sounds quite a vague answer, but um, if a handling designer is coming to us with an existing design um, and we can see the technical files, we know that we don't need to hand sample that if it's a, an existing yarn that we are aware of. I think if it's an artisan yarn that's like a, a new yarn that's been spun for the project, then we always like to test it more just to get an idea of how it performs on the loom. Um, yeah, and sometimes we might break down projects into sort of sections where we can, you know, do the design development first and then decide later on about production. So we have, um, I guess, different different pricing structures for Dash Miller and for the mill as well, because Dash and Miller are offering sort of a, a design service where it's very much led by intellectual property and um, copyright, etc. So the client is we're kind of working for the client to um create something that they're gonna own and ultimately own the copyright of mm -hmm. whereas at the mill um quite often we're supplying a product to a customer and we're retaining some of the copyright of that because it's a collection that we've created for that customer mm -hmm. um so they wouldn't then go and leave that anywhere else you see what i mean mm -hmm. yeah 
And you were saying that you um, work with you know, quite a lot of producers of, of rare breeds, of which yeah. um, there are many now in the UK. Um, what, um, and so how do you go about um, sort of deciphering what, which um, yarn will be appropriate, um, which breed would be appropriate for what end use? It's quite a specialism. Do you yeah. have um, spinners that you liaise with or do you do, yeah. do that in-house or? No, we have we have these. Um, so we've got we've built quite good relationships with the spinners that we work with. Mm -hmm. um, there are specific spinners in the UK for alpaca, for example. Or, um, I mean, one of one of the relationships we've got is uh, with the natural fiber company, who were one of the people, the original people we went to visit during our sort of initial research phase. And mm -hmm. um, we'll have a conversation with them about the fiber. So they will sort of do an analysis of the fibre and give their recommendations for what the scope of spinning is. And then from there, we can um, talk to the client about what appropriate products we could make or fabric that we could make with that end use, mm -hmm. with the with the yarn sort of specifications they give us, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so we may, we may also be pushing towards one thing. If, if the client has something in mind that they want to create, we'll sort of be trying to aim for that as well um whether it's like a thick fluffy blanket or a sleek scarf yeah um yeah and then it's 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 always a bit of a conversation that happens to to come to the right conclusion mm -hmm. um yeah and then hand looming it of course before it goes to the industrial loom is really important yeah 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 um jonathan portal from the cloth workers um livery company in his um Said that you obviously mentioned that you prefer sourcing UK yarns with mm. where possible and and dealing with UK manufacturers. Um, what more would you like to source from the UK that you currently can't? What do you think should be available? Um, Gosh. And what would UK manufacturers need to offer to to that's, get more of your business? That's really interesting. Wow. Um, I think the first thing that springs to mind is natural dyeing on an industrial scale. That would be incredible. We found a company in Belgium that offers that, and I know there are sort of smaller scale natural dyeing companies and people who are able to do that. Um, but yeah, that would be, I think, very much sought after. Um, it's practically something we're looking for every day. I mean, I think we could work it into most of the collections that we create um, and I think the other thing which is coming I feel like it's happening is, is um, fibers like hemp and um, linen and nettles etc but that kind of feels like it's happening already it, it feels like people are making strides towards getting that into a sort of a, pro a producible um, yarn so I guess we're just trying to keep in touch with people like that to see when they've got products that can be ready like market ready for example so um yeah that would be tough well if there's natural dyeing i think yes for yeah. piece dyeing and yarn dyeing mm. So, mm. Yeah. i think it's a, a matter of time isn't it so, i think so yeah yes we haven't heard any memories of projects um for natural dyeing on a large, larger scale mm. like we have with the sort of hemp fibers and things like that um, yeah, I think there's a, a lot of research mm. being done. Um, so hopefully we'll we'll see it um, exactly go through more um, commercially yeah. um, shortly. Um, do you offer internship or placement op opportunities to <laughs> students? <laughs> yeah, we normally we normally do um, because of the pandemic. Um, we collectively, as a company, made a decision to pause it. Um, our space is. It's fairly large, but it's not enormous, and our teams are quite small. So, just to keep everybody safe and to keep everything running, we decided to stop the placements, unfortunately, for the, you know, during the pandemic. But I think we're really hoping that it's going to be able to open up again later this year. Um, and we are, we have time, yeah, yeah, exactly. And we are um, launching the Kickstart scheme as well. So we we're going to have two Kickstart opportunities are actually are live now i think it was yesterday they, they went live so we're starting mm -hmm. to promote that as well um in the meantime i think for us having um 
for example, having one person or two people who are with us for a long period of time is preferable in this scenario than having um, shorter placements and more people coming and going through the space. Mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, that's what we're trying to offer in the interim. Mm -hmm. So ideally, a, yes, a placement here. Yeah. Um, Louisa is asking, how do you protect your design rights when you're giving customers online access to your samples? That's a really good question. And I don't know if there's yeah. a perfect answer for that. Um, so I think with the digital aspect, especially of the designs, um, we have full control of the back end of the platform that we can see how many times people are logging on and how long they're logging on for, et cetera, um, so that we can suspend the account if we feel like there's something funny going on. But um, we we have found that um, having that sort of human contact where possible is really key. So um, trying to arrange a Zoom meeting in conjunction with viewing the online collection is, is quite a good way of doing it. Um, a lot of the people we're working with are people that we sort of know and trust as well. So, but it is it's something that's a concern. Um, and the only way we can really protect ourselves is to make sure all of our designs are fully documented and that we really look out to see if anything's out there that we think might have been copied. But um, in, it is an exercise in trust as well because um, there isn't the technology to prevent from a screen grab, for example. We just have to try and have a good client relationship and trust mm. they won't do that mm. as well. Yes, it's it's um, a big issue. Yeah. Um, what is your research process? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm. Um, so for Dash and Miller, it's it's, it's sort of broadly looking at um, new developments, not only in textiles and fashion, but I suppose product design, architecture, current world events. It's quite broad because we're sort of trying to um I mean, we work quite closely with wgfn every season anyway on their trend reports we'll be submitting our textiles for their trends so um yeah we'll be looking at a vast scope of different areas not just um fashion textiles so obviously exhibitions as well and editorial magazines etc um but yeah, I think um, research as well goes into the raw materials and yarn as well. So we're always looking for new suppliers and new products on the market from, 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 from yarn suppliers. Um, we'll always normally attend Philo Yarn Fair and other various yarn fairs, but obviously that's again not happening at the moment. So we're just keeping in touch by email with all the yarn suppliers and um, keeping on top of what their latest products are. Um, yeah, and in terms of um, the mill, it's, it's quite often, quite often the research is into the customer itself. So we will be working with Neptune, for example, we'll be looking at their existing collections and um, other sort of companies on the market at that level and seeing what, what we can offer them that's going to merchandise well with their collection. Um, and then of course the raw materials. So making sure that we know where our yarn sources are actually coming from. Um, mm -hmm. We're working with British yarn suppliers, but some of the yarns may be coming from other places. So we, we always make sure we've got we keep track of, of that as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, following on from that, Sue is asking, um, your company seems to be very successful in terms of things like traceability, sustainable fibres, local sourcing, natural dyes. Do you think that this approach can only work with high end expensive products? Is it uh, transferable, transferable to a more mass market? Have you done any work, work with more mass market uh, brands? Um, from a design perspective, um, from Dash and Miller's perspective, we, we do work with sort of high street brands. I think um, with the mill, it's, it is tricky because, I mean, I, I suppose Neptune, for example, is a high street, has a high street presence. They have um, their outlets on the high street, but they are, I know, sort of, at the upper end of the pricing range for that kind of product so I think having something woven in England does come with that price tag as well sometimes um I think 
as it becomes more widely required, I think it's customers are now a lot more uh, savvy than they were and they want, you know, they're asking for these types of things. So I think it's a matter of getting the suppliers in the other country, in countries that are able to produce at a slightly lower price point, for example, um, on board with the idea. And through our yarn research, we're seeing it, we're seeing it happening. Um, for example, um, we've been speaking recently to for a specific project to suppliers of polyester yarns, and um, a lot of them now are offering recycled options, whereas before that wasn't really something that was a, an option. So I think it's it's starting to happen. I mean, in terms of natural dyeing and things like art, artisanal processes, um, it is, it's, I suppose, more of an aspirational product quite a lot of the time. So I hope that it will become more accessible. Um, I think the more widely it becomes available, hopefully that will be the case. Mm -hmm. um, Janet um, Prescott said uh, she's impressed with the scope and variety of, of what you do. Um, and are there any untried fibres you'd like to approach or, or blends that are exciting you? For example, in, in developing blends of animal fibres, plant-based yarns, Mm. Um, and you've just touched on synthetics. Yeah, I think um, something we're really interested in the moment, at the moment is recycled fibres. So um, looking at recycled wools and recycled cottons and what we can do with those. Um, yeah, that's, that's something that we're really focusing on. I think um, we've woven with beautiful wool hemp qualities for example and that's been really interesting but I think recycling is I mean in the UK as well like recycled fibres um there are sort of companies doing it and I think it's something that we want to explore a lot more of yeah it's sort of a different angle that we've not introduced into the collection before mm -hmm. yeah um We'll run on a few more minutes. We have run yeah. over the time. We've got still quite a lot of questions coming in. <laughs> um, I realise that some people will need to um, leave. Um, but um, if everyone's OK to, to stay on a little longer, we'll, um, or those that are, we'll, we'll run on a, um, a little bit further. Um, yes, Hannah Lamb is asking, what would be your dream project or client? Oh, my goodness. Wow. <laughs> That's a really hard one. Um, was there anyone when you set out um, with the business? What was your intention when you set it up with yeah. the weaving mill? Did you have any target customers in mind then, or has your yeah. client base evolved? It's very. I think it it has evolved. I mean, um, one of as a younger designer, one of my dreams is to have a fabric on the Chanel catwalk, um, and we did achieve that. So I'm. I'm pleased with that, but I think I think a dream would be now to um, work with a company like that on more sustainable fabrics and using, you know, more sustainable yarns. So, in some ways, I feel I feel, <laughs> I feel silly saying this. But in some ways, we are already working on our dream projects, I guess, because um, we're sort of able to explore those things with our clients. Um, so I think, yeah, being able to make a difference in a company like that, for example, or like a, a large brand would be a real dream to take on that sort of, um, I suppose, uh, experimental design to like find new solutions to making their products more sustainable, more sustainable. That would be amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and um, Hannah is, Hannah Lewis is asking, is work experience more important um, than the skills shown in a portfolio when looking to employ mm -hmm. designers slash weavers? Wow. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's more important. I really, no, I wouldn't say that. I think, um, I think if your portfolio shows um, versatility and an understanding, a technical understanding, that's, that's really important. I think work experience is desirable, but we, I think most employers are aware it's not always some, it's not always an option for every, everybody. Mm. Um, and I think it's useful, it's more useful for the 
the prospective employee, I think, to build contacts and build a network. Um, perhaps then the other way around than the employer finding it sort of the useful thing, I think. I mean, I know personally a lot of contacts that I made during my work experience then have been helpful and um, informative later on. So, yeah, I yeah, think so we're getting quite a few questions around, around that sort of subject. And I think, you know, students may be missing out on practical work this year and how they catch that. up in terms of their technical yeah. knowledge um you know were there any sort of specific yeah specifics there um that's really it's really hard isn't it because i know like access to balloons is a big issue mm. um i mean of course like if it's possible i would just recommend getting a loom but i know that's not possible for everybody so mm -hmm. um there are sort of various there obviously are various books you can buy to study and like online software like that are free or maybe cost a pound that you can download that could be useful. Um, I can't think of the name of them at the moment, but I'm sure there was a software that was about a pound that you can buy like a weaving software. So I'm sure if you Google free software uh -huh. weaving, it would come up with something. Um, but I think, yeah, I think ultimately if you're able to get access to Loom somehow, that would be obviously recommended um yeah and i guess i'm not i'm not really sure how much the support tutors have, have been able to offer students during the pandemic it, it must vary i assume um depending on people's sort of capabilities but um i suppose trying to get a lot of contact with tutors would be helpful if you can so obviously talk about let you know have technical mm -hmm tutorials and things like that yeah but yeah again i'm not it's sure just, how possible yes. that is um just gathering from i think all, all those sources yeah. that you've mentioned it's it's obviously been a really tough time isn't yeah. it um and one thing i think would be really useful and actually fairly accessible for everybody would be um creating a, a fabric catalog for yourself of qualities that you could maybe get free samples from shops or online I don't know, places like John Lewis, for example, who mm -hmm. maybe send out free samples. Um, even if just base fabrics and techniques and things like that, that would be really, really useful, I think, like a library of yes. twill, yeah. you know, That's basic structures, mm -hmm. basic structures and yeah. qualities. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, just going back to the um, the natural dyeing, this, um, um, a, a sort of a pertinent question here that um, Leaves is asking. Um, I understand the market is asking for natural dyeing, but on a larger scale, um, it can require a lot of water or yeah. land. Or what is your what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, no, I do understand that. Um, there are, I suppose, I'm not an expert in this, but I do understand the problem. Um, there are things that we've heard of that can sort of help with that there um, are sort of natural, I mean, one of the farms we work with, for example, um, they have a natural wetland filtration system. Um, so perhaps that could help tackle the, the water, uh, wastewater, for example, and um, recycle that water into usable water for re-dyeing, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, and there are sort of, ways of using, I believe, I, there was a TED talk, I think, about um, using natural bacteria as well during the dyeing process instead of mordants. Mm -hmm. So that could be something that's an option, but I, I still, that still doesn't require less water. Um, I do believe there are projects underway, like innovation projects underway for water-free dyeing processes. Um, I don't know whether that stretches into natural dyeing, but, um, I mean, ultimately, I suppose the best thing you can do is use the natural colour of the animal, of the fibre mm -hmm. as well. So, yes. Um, yeah. Someone's asking, um, so we'll just um, have a couple more questions and I think we'll, we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately, although they're still coming in. Um, yes, do you use merino wool at all? Um, yeah, yeah, we do. Um, so we, 
we do work with a couple of UK suppliers who supply merino wool that's coming from Australia or South Africa, for example. And I know that there are some questions about merino wool and its sustainability and its sort of ethical angle, I suppose. So um, we're very much working with our trusted suppliers who are also working to the highest welfare standards, etc. Um, and it still does have that, um, I suppose, that stigma on the market that people want merino. They see it as a luxury fibre. Mm -hmm. But we do try and use British wool like where possible. So using finishing, I think, can really like elevate a British yarn. So, for example, we we try and use Shetland wool sometimes in place of merino, and through finishing, bring a lot more softness to it. And there are there are merino like British merino wools available. So yeah. we are you are using British wool for both fashion and interiors. Yeah, yeah we do. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, I mean, especially the client's own yarn as well. Quite often, the client's own fibre. So people who come to us with their own fibre, they they make, they would want scarves or um, tailoring fabric, for example. Mm -hmm. So we use their yarn for that mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. So um, yes, I think um, you know what what we're saying is you know um, relationships are key, aren't they? Both in terms of your yeah. your suppliers and um, so just in terms of a, a final question, um, Ben is asking, how have you built up your client base over the years? Do you find, um, do clients find you or um, do you reach out to them? That's a good question. Um, so Dash and Miller, we've always reached out. And obviously once you start getting your name out there and your reputation, people come to you as well. Mm -hmm. um, I guess at the mill we've, We've never actually done any active marketing and people have always come to us. So I think um, the very process of setting up um, has sort of publicised us enough that um, people have heard of us. And I think, again, it goes quite back, unique, isn't it? The, yeah, I think it goes back to relationships as well, like what you were saying. Um, because everything we're doing is sort of experimental, we are relying really on our relationships with our suppliers um, for their expertise too. Um, so we have quite good relationships with the spinners where <clears throat> they'll recommend us to their, to their clients. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, we're very fortunate that we haven't really had to sort of go out to look for business for the mill. Mm -hmm. um, and at Dash and Miller, it's a combination of both because um, part of what we love is going out and visiting people, obviously, as well, when we are able to. So mm -hmm. it's a bit of a mixture of both, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, on that note, um, I think um, we've covered as, you know, a great number of, of questions. Thank you for, for all your answers, uh, no Juliet. It's been really fascinating um, talk and um, just hearing hearing more about, you know, how um, the Bristol Weaving Mill works alongside Dash and Miller um, and its Thank unique uh, setup. Yeah. Um, so yes, on behalf of the Bradford Textile Society, I'd like to thank you very much for um, joining us this evening, Juliet. And um, thank, you. thank you to all our attendees and to all of your questions as well. Um, we have our final lecture of the series next month, um, exploring the 1940s to 1950s James Cleveland Bell American Prince Collection at the Bradford Textile Archive. And that talk will be given by Tammy Stewart, course leader of Leeds Arts University. And that's on Tuesday, the 13th of April at 6.30 p.m. Um, for anyone interested in membership, um, details are on our website. Membership gives free access to all of our talks and um, preferential access to our annual dinner and our design seminar. Um, when you um, uh, leave this webinar this evening, there is um, a very brief survey, which um, would be very grateful if you could complete. It will take no longer than a minute and will help to inform our events for next year. And um, so I'd just like to say thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you. Thank you.